each other we will walk hand in hand and together we'll spread the news that God is in our land and they'll know we are Christian by our love by our love yes they'll know we are Christian by our love we will work with each other we will work side by side we will work with each other we will work side by side and we'll guard each one's dignity and save each one's pride and they'll know we are christian by our love by our love yes they'll know we are christians by our love So we'll just have the offering brought in and then we'll say the Lord's Prayer. And if you can join me, you'll see in the order of service the statement of faith. Savi, would you grab the offering? Lord, we are so grateful for all that you do. This is your day that you have made for us. May we cherish it each minute, each moment. May we spend it in love, caring for each other, remembering you. And may this be an offering worthy to give back to you. Amen. Your word, O Lord, is a lamp unto our feet and a guide unto our path. Amen. So before we do the Lord's Prayer, let's do the New Church Statement of Faith. The faith of the New Church is summarized as follows. Together, I believe in one God, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom is the divine Trinity. A saving faith is to believe on him. Evil actions ought not to be done because they are of the devil and from the devil. Good actions ought to be done because they are of God and from God. Moreover, these things ought to be done by us as of ourselves, but we should believe that they are from the Lord acting with us and through us. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Please be seated. So I'm going to have Paul come up in a moment to go through the reading with us. We're back in Mark and the Messiah, which we finished last year, but then we had Christmas, so it can be a little bit of a, a delay between what we remember. So we're just going to very quickly recap before Paul comes. If you remember, we started with the disciples and the Lord crossing the Sea of Galilee. And so often in our life, it's these storms that define us, the storms that come. But for many people, they never seem to get through the storms. The storms is where they get stuck. And when we look, we think, where is the Lord? He's asleep. Where is he? But when we come through the storms, then we find the demoniac. The Lord comes to the other side, and there was a man filled with the demoniac. And what we find when we come through our storms in life is that not that we're necessarily filled with uh, demons or anything like that, 
but that we are plagued by intrusive thoughts. We all know that we get lots of intrusive thoughts and feelings and they attack us. But this is that moment in our spiritual life where we begin to realize I am not necessarily my thoughts and I'm not necessarily my feelings. But too often because I thought it or I felt it, well, it must be me. But the Lord cast the demoniac out into the swine. And when you look at the swine, you can't help but kind of be repulsed. But that's that moment in our life where we're realizing the Lord is who I want to be like. And so these intrusive thoughts and these intrusive feelings, we need to cast them out. And for the first time, we start to have a repulsion for those parts of our life and an attraction to those areas where we're like the Lord. He, of course, said, oh, Lord, let me follow you. But the Lord said, no, go, go back to your people and let them know what the Lord's done for you. So then the Lord gets in the boat and they go back over the sea. And this is where we're at now. We have this story of Jairus. His daughter is on the point of death. I mean, imagine the pain that you feel, a 12-year-old daughter on the point of death, and he's heard the word that the Lord Jesus can heal, and he goes to find the Lord. And in the process, these two stories cross each other. He finds the Lord, says, will you come and lay hands on my daughter? He says, yes, I'll come. So off they go. But like all journeys, it's never straightforward. In, in the process... This woman has a need, the woman with the issue of blood, which she's also had for 12 years. She sneaks up behind the Lord from behind, she touches the hem of his garment, and she's instantly healed. And then the Lord says, someone was healed, I felt power go out of my body. Who touched me? Who touched you, the disciples say? You're kidding, right? You're the Messiah, everybody wants to reach up and touch you as you walk by. No, no, somebody touched me in faith. And this is an important part of the story now, that how we approach the Lord, that when we approach the Lord in faith, we receive. Even though he didn't even know she was there, she crept up behind and touched his garment. But I want you to think for a moment, because this event, we just kind of read it in the Bible, and it's kind of like it happens, and then on they go. But realistically, it could have taken an hour. It might have taken two hours of their time. Disruption. That now brings us to the reading, Paul, if you'll come up. That brings us to the reading of today where Jairus is pac patiently waiting. Jairus is patiently waiting for the Lord to come and heal his daughter. This event happens, and then we now come to this rather tender and very painful and very beautiful part of the story where someone comes from Jairus' house and says, leave the master alone. Your daughter's already dead. And it's very tender because you know, just a little 12-year-old girl. But when we understand the spiritual significance of what's going on here, it becomes very, very tender to us as well. So before, before we go into that, Paul, if you'll come up, here is something to help lead us into our, in our thoughts into the reading today. Reading from Secrets of Heaven, there are two basic categories of desire. The desire for what is good and the desire for what is true. The former, the desire for goodness, constitutes a heavenly or celestial religion and the word calls it both the daughter of Zion and the virgin daughter of Zion. The latter though, the desire for truth, constitutes a spiritual religion and the word calls it daughter of Jerusalem. Paul, if you'll lead us in the, in the reading today. The reading from uh, <coughs> Mark chapter 5. While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain, which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and seeth the tumults, and them that wept and wailed greatly. And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado, and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed, 
him to scorn. But when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel, and them that were with him, and entereth in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand, and said unto her, Talitha kumi, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, Arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of twelve years. And they were astonished with great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it, and commanded that something should be given her to eat. Beautiful, thanks Paul. The Lord tells us that we are blessed when we come to him, when we hear his word and we obey it. Amen. Just hearing that reading afresh, it just stirs so many things in me and I already want to start preaching, you know, about so many significant things. But we just pause for a moment and if we, we, we don't have a lot of the children here today, mostly mine, I think. It's I wonder if they'd come forward anyway just to support dad and we'll have a look at the talk that we have for the children today. So it's very befitting that we're talking about Jesus raising Jairus' daughter from the dead. And I wanted to look at an event that had happened just a little bit earlier, just a short bit, bit earlier. This would have been the first time the disciples would have seen the Lord raise someone from the dead. And it was a widow's son. In fact, they, uh, th that event that we just saw of Jairus' daughter, that happens up in Capernaum, which is just a little bit north of where they are right now. And it's, in, uh, it's possibly a few days later. We're not sure of the time, but it's a little bit later. But here they come. They, they're going south into Galilee. They pass Nazareth, the city where Jesus spent much of his life. They come about 8 miles or 12 k's below. And they're, they're walking most of the day. They probably did a long walk. It's getting to the end of the day. They come to the outside of the city. And what do they find? A funeral. And that's what they often did. They would take the person who'd passed carry them out of the little town, out into the fields to bury them. And so you can imagine the disciples and Jesus approaching, very tired, very hungry, exhausted, and they see this woman grieving as you do. And I just love the way the Lord sees people's suffering. It says he's moved with compassion, and he goes and he raises, he just like that, just raises this boy back to life. I just can't imagine how mum would have felt. I just imagine mum. It says that she's a widow. So she's already lost dad. She's already lost her husband. And she probably found some comfort in her son. You would. Your children. You'd find some comfort there. And then she loses her son. So this is a very, you know, a, a grieving thing. And, uh, you know, something tells us that, you know, mum and dad should go first and that mum and dad shouldn't be burying their kids. It doesn't work that way. But I just love the way Jesus comes in here with answers. He has the answer that we're looking for. He raises this boy to life and the joy and the happiness that, that would have been in the mum and the astonishment. You know, there's something about having an encounter with God. You'll almost always go away a little bit shocked, astonished, in awe. And we don't hear about these kind of things. It's only Jesus that does this, except there is, for these people, they would have had the story going back to Elijah hundreds of years earlier. Elijah did something very similar. So here it is here. Elijah, when he first started his ministry, there was a famine that broke out in the land and there was a widow. And Elijah went to the widow and said, give me something to eat. And she she said, I've only got a little bit of flour left, but because you're a prophet, I'll just use up what I've got and it'll be my last meal. But she found that the pot never ran out. There was always more flour in there and she was able to just keep feeding. So that kind of has Elijah, you know, he's not silly. He knows what he's doing. He says, I'm going to hang around here. God's doing something here. I'll hang around. There's always a, a good meal. A little bit later on, the widow's son dies and she cries out to the man of God and says, do something, do something. You're a man of God. And this is an example of where Elijah raises the boy from the dead by the power of God. And the only other time that we, we see something like this is with his disciple, Elisha, who also raises uh, a, young, a widow's young boy from the dead. 
from the dead as well. But these are beautiful stories, things that you don't really, you know, they're not normal in our day, you know, but they happen. They're real stories that happen in the Bible, and they happen because there's a very special meaning in it for us. So right now, you young people have an advantage that us older people don't. You've got hope and vision and excitement about the future. I think uh, you've got this freshness with God. And you might be saying in your heart, ah, God and me, we're going places. We're going to do things. And I hope you do. I hope that is. In fact, let's just say a little prayer. Just say, just say dear Lord, stay with me all the days of my life. Be with me in everything. Amen. They have this sort of young, youthful hope. But what these stories are telling us on a deeper level is that sometimes the hope that we have in God when we're little, we come to church and we hear these stories, can very easily get dashed. Things can happen in life and you think, well, where is God in all of this? And it's those moments where it can seem like our childhood love for God can die. But the promise of the Lord today for us, no matter where you find yourself in life, any of us, adults too, if we will come, it's been my experience, the Lord will always put that life back in us, put that hope back in, bring back to life <coughs> those childhood loves that we have. So let's keep that in our thoughts today. Uh, as it, we're going to sing a song and then mum's going to take you off for class. But let's just close with a final prayer and just say, Dear Lord, I open my heart to you. Protect it always. Let me trust in you and never lose that trust. Amen. Yeah. So Max, if you'll take us into a song. We have a couple of readings on the back of the order of service for preparation for Holy Supper. I didn't have a chance to ask, but Gay, would you like to come and read those? 
Thanks. From John chapter 6, Jesus replied, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you perform so that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us this bread at all times. Jesus answered, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. And from Secrets of Heaven, 1737. The joining of mankind to the Lord is effected by means of temptations and by the implanting of the faith in love. Unless faith is implanted in love, that is, unless a person by means of things belonging to faith receives the life of faith, which is charity, conjunction is not possible. This alone is is what to follow him implies, namely to be joined to the Lord, even as the Lord, with regard to his human essence, was joined to Jehovah. For the same such reason, all such people are called sons of God. Amen. Thank you. So as we gather around the Lord's table today to eat his bread and to drink his wine, take a moment to think about how special it is to have a meal with someone. When you come and you sit and you eat with someone, there's something special. There's a bond. It's, it's not visible, but it's there. There's an eating. There's a nourishing of ourself. And when we come to the Lord's table, we're actually eating of the very life of the Lord himself. What a wonderful thought to, to come and partake of the very life. The bread is God's goodness. He wants us to eat and be filled with goodness. And the wine, it's him filling us with his understanding, with that comprehension, that appreciation, the love to understand the Lord, to know and understand him. So today as we gather around the table, let's, let's just remember how special it is that we get this opportunity to come together, to eat together, but to eat the Lord's bread and to drink his wine and to be made more whole in that love. Ken, would you come forward? So on that faithful night so long ago, the Lord gathered in that upper room with his disciples. They sat eating with him and he took bread and he lifted it to heaven. He, he gave a blessing and then he broke that bread. He said, this is my body broken for you. Eat. Your word says, Lord, to taste and see that you are good.
again on that faithful night, the Lord took the cup and he lifted it up and he gave a blessing. And then he looked to his disciples. He said, this is my blood poured out for you for the remission of sins. Drink ye all of it. Truly you are the light of this world, Lord Jesus. May we walk in that light and know your life. Amen. Okay, so continuing what we were reading from what Paul read for us earlier today, there are four key points that I'd like to make today from, from that reading. And those key points are that it's important how we approach the Lord. Uh, how, the how is very important, how we approach the Lord. There is this touching of the hem of his garment. We need to sort of refresh that. What, what is it to touch the hem of his garment? There's these words from the Lord himself. Only believe. What does he mean by that? Uh, what, how do you only believe? What, what's going on there? And then we have this final commandment from the Lord, give the woman, the girl, something to eat. What's going on there with the whole eating, you know, partaking of eating? But before I look at those four, you get a fifth or a bonus today. There's going to be a <laughs> another one. And they were astonished with great astonishment. There's this thing about encountering God. We never know exactly when we're going to encounter him. But when you do, you're always left with a sense of awe, isn't it? You're always moved. You, you, you don't, you come away different. You know, there's a story of Moses going up to the mountain and having to actually cover his face because he was kind of embarrassed because he was radiating God's presence, radiating with, uh, glowing with God's life. And whenever we have these divine encounters in our life, we're left changed. We, we really are. We're transformed and we're, we're left in a state of a new kind of worship and awe and astonishment. So this is the big thing that we, that we really encourage people in the new church. The word has a much deeper side to it. This is the Lord in flesh for us. This is how the Lord is communicating to us. He's not here physically anymore, but we have his word. And so when we spend time in his word, we're going to have these divine encounters and we're going to be left in awe. But I just kind of want to reassure everyone, you know, because we hear these things again and again. Here's what we read in Doctrine of Sacred Scripture, paragraph 8. The word interiorly is spiritual and celestial. It's written exclusively by correspondences. <coughs> and just to remind us, what, is, what does that mean? It means it's written in the language of angels. Angels, when they come to you, will give you a dream or a vision. It's that beautiful symbolic language. The word is written with this power to it, these, this correspondence. What is thus written is it in its ultimate sense written in a style such as in that of the prophets and the evangelists, which although it may appear common, yet conceals within it divine and all angelic wisdom. So when we read the word, we don't just want to read it and say, oh, wow, I feel so much better for Jairus now because he was, he was at the point of losing his daughter. She was at the point of death. She was dead. And now we can rejoice with him because 
his daughter is again alive. Yes, that happened, but it's speaking to us again today. Ask yourself, what might be hemorrhaging in your life, in your relationship with God? And what might be on the brink of death? And how can the Lord speak to that today? What is his promise? What is he telling us in the scriptures today? So let's have a look at these four things. Starting with uh, how we approach the Lord. Secondly, the, the touching of the hem of the garment, only believe and something to eat. Let's move into how we approach the Lord. I think this is important because, you know, we talk about the fear of God. It's a big thing that we talk about in Christian circles, the fear of God. But what is the fear of God? It's not being afraid of God. You know, if I, if I come up and talk to, to Jeff here and say, how are you doing, Jeff? I will be thinking internally very carefully, how can I please him? How can I not say something that's offensive or rude? Or, or, or you know, I'm thinking about how to have a good interaction with him. That's much like the fear of God. We're coming to the Lord not where, where there's a, a sense of not wanting to do anything to hurt that relationship. It's not that we're afraid of God. We just don't want to hurt that relationship in any way. Isn't it? Think about young couples when they first start dating. <coughs> They're ever so fearful about saying and doing the wrong thing. They're not afraid of each other. They just want to please each other and, and do that. It's the same with the, the fear of the Lord. But what we do find here in this story, we're going to see that the woman with the issue of blood, she was very afraid. She snuck up to the Lord from behind. Here's what um, Hebrews says about our faith towards God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God or please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So there's two very important parts to what Hebrews is saying here. First of all, you've got to believe there is a God. That's important. You, you, you're not going to have a relationship with God if you don't believe there is one. But that's not enough, is it? It's not enough to believe there's a God. In fact, I think in the epistles, was it James or someone said, the devils believe in God, tremble, and then still go and sin. You know, like it's, it's not enough to believe in God, but it's believing that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So what is scripture telling us here? It's saying, do you really believe that God is good? God is good. Yes, but Darren, there's a heaven and there's a hell. Yes, there is. But, but that, it all comes down to our understanding of what God is doing there. You know, if you're looking at God as angry, as vengeful, then of course, y you may not see God as someone who rewards those who seek after him. You might in fact say, I'm going to go, the, you know, I'm going to go this way because God's angry and vengeful. But is God really angry and vengeful? No. There's no anger or vengeance in God at all. God is love. Our experience of that love as it outfolds and unworks in our life could be comparable to, well, I think I just upset God's apple cart, or oh, I think God's trying to deal with me right now. You know, there can be a sense of God being angry. God's never really angry, no. And can you prove that? Well, I, the, the only time I can ever see the Lord himself being angry, ever, is when they defiled the temple, isn't it? And it says he sat down and made a whip and then drove them out. So he wasn't just impulsively running in there and getting angry with everybody, was he? He sat down and said, this isn't right. Made a whip and said, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna flush this temple out. So you know, the idea of God's anger is really, he's angry if you want to bless you. He's passionate to bless you and not have things hurt you. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, we, this idea though that God, that, that uh, I believe in God, but boy, I, I, I won't talk to him because I know I'm more than likely going to get myself in trouble. You know, this idea. We, the Lord wants this intimate relationship with us very much. Romans 8.28 says it this way. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God and who are called according to his purposes. And of course, in Secrets of Heaven again, mourning is a state of peace. For peace is said to be like the dawn on the earth, which fills people's minds with overall delight. And the truth of peace is like the light of dawn. This truth is being called the truth of peace. Is the divine truth itself present in heaven and coming from the Lord? What you notice, it's not saying divine love. It's divine truth. And this is something I think in Christianity we have messed up so badly over the centuries. 
is that we just kind of wrap truth and love together in one big bucket. And they're not. Divine truth is how we see and know him. Divine love is how we interact with him. And you can't love that which you haven't seen or don't know or understand. Isn't it? The more so this is such an important aspect here of that we this is Jairus, by the way, and his daughter versus the woman with the issue of blood. They're different parts of our life going on. And we'll look at that in a moment. But I just this is one of my favorite passages because it goes on to say that peace influences all there in heaven without exception and causes heaven to be heaven. Peace holds within itself trust in the Lord. The trust that God is governing all things and is providing all things and that he leads towards an end that is good. When we believe these things about him, we are at peace. Since we fear nothing and have no anxiety about things to come, nor do they disturb us. How far we attain to this state depends on how far we attain love for the Lord. So you can sort of look back over the last few years of your life and go with the whole pandemic and everything. A bit of a test, wasn't it, in some ways for us spiritually? How disturbed were you? I was very disturbed at times. I became anxious at times. I was troubled at times. And then I had to go and ground myself again in, in the Lord. What's the worst thing that can happen to me? I die and I go be with the Lord. <coughs> but, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to forget that and get all caught up in the fear of the now, isn't it? You know, we get that, you know, it's very easy. So to the degree that we've actually come into that love for the Lord, to that degree we find peace. But notice it's the peace of truth. I, I need to see and understand the Lord. We all need to see and understand the Lord. Say after me, dear Lord, <laughs> fill me right now with your peace, a peace that comes from knowing you and understanding your heart. Amen. Yeah. It's not that easy to have peace and no anxiety if you think God is angry and vengeful. That doesn't work. They don't, you know, those two are kind of contrary, which is one of the main reasons the Lord took flesh and blood, so we could see what love is like. You know, prior to that, we had this partial revelation, this cloudy, shadowy revelation of the thundering, angry God. You know, it's, it's just not who God is. But we needed to see that. We needed to see that, that in action. Okay, so this woman with the issue of blood, she represents our affection for goodness. Do you have an affection for goodness? Every head nods, yes. Say after me, Lord, Lord. I have a love and an affection for what is good. Amen. So she represents our heart side of our spiritual life. Our heart, you know that love, touch, feel, heart side. And you will always run the other way. I really want you to get this today. This is a key point of what this passage is teaching us today. If you try to approach God on a love and feeling basis only, the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. You, you, you know, there's a few times in my life I've had a very, very divine encounter. I can remember one time I woke up and there was an angel at the foot of my bed. And, and there was kind of like rainbows spraying out. And it felt like I was under water, uh, under a waterfall, crashing down on me. Right? And then the angel said one thing. She said, Darren. And it got worse. The crashing sort of sense. And I had to say, stop. And then it disappeared. I never got to hear what the, <laughs> what the angel wanted to say because I couldn't cope with the presence of just one angel. This is the reality. You know, every one of us, when we stand before God, are going to want to run the other direction. We will. Our heart will tremble before God. And it's not the Lord. The Lord wants to take us in and gather us and, and, and draw us near to us. It's our heart that's broken. It's our heart that's kind of caught up in its own selfishness and then suddenly in the light of God, love, unconditional love, we realize, I really am quite selfish. I, you know, Peter, you know, first time he meets Jesus, he's out fishing all night. And then the master walks up and says, Peter, throw the net on the other side. Oh, please. Because it is you, master or rabbi, I'll do it. Throws it in. Immediately the net's full. They can't pull the net in. But it's Peter's reaction that I love. They pull this net in, and then he turns and says, 
get away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. And then Jesus says, don't worry about it. I'm going to turn you into a fisher of men. So our heart will always do this. This is why we're so blessed to have the scriptures. This is the hem of his garment. The literal sense, what's written down there is the hem of his garment. We can come to it no matter what state you're in. You can come to that Bible again and again and read it and you will get what you need from it. But you'll also be able to, you know, run away from the Lord. Notice the Lord's response. He didn't say, come and follow me like he did to so many others. He just knew. He said, daughter. He didn't say sister. He said, daughter. That's the Father God right there. He said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Isn't it? He kind of, he's saying to us, our heart will always only cope with so much of God. That's the truth of it. So what's the answer? Well, this, this is an interruption, remember. This is right in the middle of Jairus' story. So we'll come back to that. So how we approach the Lord really matters. The touching of the hem of his garment. We have the word written as it is because it gives us a way to approach the divine in all his holiness and for us to not melt into a puddle, basically. It's a gift, such a gift. And we can see that because it says in the scripture, you know, these things are told to us in the scripture. What does it say in, in 1 John? Where is it? It's coming. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. And in him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shined in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not so it doesn't matter what religion you are if you're born on earth as a man or a woman there's a light inside you and that's the word that's God but it's our darkness that lack of comprehending him that makes us again run the other way isn't it and so when we're following the Lord what we're really doing is we're following that light and we're dealing with that darkness that we find inside us. And I just love what it goes on to say. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld the glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So here we are, we have the word and now it's saying the word needs to become flesh in you, in each one of us. And that's how we're going to see God. But it's about spending that time in the word and letting the word do that work on us. Because when we read it, I'm reading it with my mind, with my darkness, with my filters. But if I spend time in it enough, my filters will lift and I'll see him in it. In every aspect of it, every little part. Okay, so let's go to this statement, only believe. Now when you look back over the history of Christianity, you can actually see how we have grabbed onto this statement, so many different denominations and movements, only believe, and we've kind of come up with these doctrines of faith only. And that is not what the Lord is talking about here. If it was just a matter of only believing, then when Jesus dealt with a woman who's caught in adultery, yeah, remember that story? They bring her to him to try and trap Jesus, accuse him, get him to say something angry or vengeful or, or, or nasty. And very wisely, the Lord doesn't say anything, but he writes in the dirt and then he says, he who has, cast, he who has no sin casts the first stone. And we don't know what he wrote in the dirt, but I believe he wrote their sins. He might have even written the name of women that they'd had affairs with. Who knows? But he wrote their sin as only he, the prophet of all prophets, would know. And it says the elders got up and left first. And then the younger ones left. Whatever he wrote, it struck. And then he turns to the woman and says, where are they? Where are your accusers? And she says, they're not here, they're gone. Well, neither do I accuse you. And then he says, only believe. No, he doesn't. He very carefully says, now go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. So the, the teachings of Jesus are very clear. We, we need to grow out of sin and into righteousness. That's a journey. We need to do that. And these words, only believe, are not talking about that. Okay, And we can look at the ingredients of what's going on here. So what does this only believe mean? You know, it's when we're in our crisis, isn't it? And we get that bad news and we're in the middle of a crisis that the Lord's saying, okay, all the storms aside, just hold on to me. Believe in my goodness. Yeah, but aren't you vengeful? 
Aren't you angry? Maybe you're punishing me. There's a lot of people that believe that. That what's going on in their life is a punishment from God. Have you ever thought that yourself? I probably have at times. Oh, yeah, I must have really messed up because God's... No, God's not a punisher. That's right. He's a rewarder of those that seek him, not a punisher. Oh, I've got to remember that. got to remember that, Lord. It's not you punishing me. That's one of the best things about Job. I used to hate the book of Job. I don't really like it. But its message, if you look at it carefully, is that Satan is the troublemaker causing his life. Not the, not the Lord, but all Job could see was, Oh, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Uh -uh. The Lord giveth and never taketh away. My peace I give you, not like the world gives you. They can't take that from you. So, you know, Job teaches us as the devil is our problem, not the Lord. Okay, so only believe. So what is the Lord saying? He's saying, hold on to that belief that God is good. In your trouble, your battle, whatever you're going through right now, and I promise every one of us is going through something, hold on that God is good. Good. Wants a good end. Wants a good outcome. And can I prove that? Yes, I can, because let's have a look at the context. It says that after, after Jairus gets the bad news, right? You, you, you ever had a thought about God, oh, God's going to bless me? And then another thought comes, a bad, you know, bad word, a bad thought, a bad feeling even. And you think, oh, I got that wrong. God isn't trying to bless me. <laughs> okay, there is the household of Jairus coming and saying, leave the master alone. It's done. She's dead. What can he do now? Isn't it? The, the, you know, the world has such a way, evil spirits have such a way of telling us, this one's done. It's over. What can God do? And I'm not saying that his family were being mean. They just, they just don't bother him. She's gone. Imagine how Jairus felt at that moment. I wonder if he thought that woman, she held us up. Maybe if that didn't happen, you know, what if? But, you know, how many times are we doing the what ifs, you know, with God? Oh, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Maybe I shouldn't have gone there that day. Maybe I shouldn't have done this. Our life can be plagued with these kind of thoughts and feelings. And these are the moments where the Lord is saying, no, only believe. Right? Put aside all those ramblings and questions and fears and doubts and just hold on to the fact that God is good. And we, we can see it because he, he says to Jairus, only believe, and then he says he wouldn't let anyone, any man, and a man in scripture represents truth, any man follow him. Say Peter, James and John. And you've heard me teach on this before. The 12 disciples represent 12 areas in our life we need to discipline ourselves. They all represent something. You know, Judas is repentance, Thomas is positive questioning and doubts. You know, Philip is a love of understanding, all these things. But only Peter, James and John are allowed to come. Peter, James and John. So what do they represent? Well, Peter is our faith in the Lord. Faith that, that God is real. James is our hope that we can love the way he loves. Charity that we can be loving in charity just like he is. And John is our love for him. They're the only things that really matter in a battle when, when you're in a crisis, is that you hold on to your conviction that God is good. Hold on to that, right? That he has a plan to make you into his image and likeness of love and that you will love the Lord. You will come through and love the Lord more, not less. If Jairus' daughter had died, that represents something in you, an affection for comprehending God. And we all have this affection to want to understand God, don't we? I do. I'm burning desire to want to understand. What are you doing, God? If that dies, you've lost something terrible. In fact, I would say you can't have a very deep relationship with God if, if Jairus' daughter dies. If you lose that affection for understanding God, you're never going to have a very... You're always going to be the woman with issue of blood. blood. Touch and run. I'll touch, I'll get what I need and I'll run but you'll never have this closeness. Because it, you notice that what Jairus does? He says, come Lord, come into my house, into my inner chamber and lay hands on my daughter. Okay, Fa uh, Corinthians says, now abideth faith, hope and love. And these three, but the greatest is love. Okay, so I want you to notice too that Veronica, that's what some people say her name was, the woman with the issue of blood, Veronica. She represents our, our affection for God's goodness, our affection for good.
it'll only take you so far to the hem of his garment. And that's enough to get what you need in a lot of places. But this story is saying the Lord wants a much deeper relationship with us. That's where our Jairus daughter needs to be healed. This affection to understand God. It's not impossible to understand God. Oh, but Darren, you don't know what it's like to be me. I read those scriptures and it's like, what are you trying to say, God? They just, I know what it's like. It takes years for them to open up and really speak to you. Because the truth is it would harm you if they opened too quickly. But we need to just hold on and believe this is how we have a divine encounter with the Lord. Okay. So let's move to this last point about giving the girl something to eat. I heard it said many, many years ago, and I just didn't question it at the time. A preacher once said, well, you know, she'd just come back from the dead. Give the body something to eat. Keep her spirit in the body. You wouldn't want her spirit to slip. And I didn't really give it much thought. But if you think about it, that, that's kind of like, well, Jesus is a miracle worker, but he could, you know, he, he's got limits, so we better feed the body and make sure. <laughs> he got the spirit back in there, but I wouldn't want it to escape and disappear again. <laughs> you know, it, it, I can understand, and it, 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 you know, it, it makes sense, feed the body. Uh, I just never thought about it, but it's not what it means. It's not what scripture is telling us here. Right now, the Lord is saying, give the child something to eat. So let's make this very practical. Every one of us somewhere in our life have had this affection to try and understand God. And at some point, it's been dashed. Our hopes have been dashed. But here we are now today, years later, looking back and going, I don't have that problem anymore in that area. I now understand what God is doing. He's brought that back to life. But you must do this. You must feed that new level of intimacy. Whenever God Reveal something to you, feed it. Feed it. Give it, give it something to eat. Okay, here's a passage to kind of help with, with, with the idea. Give us something to eat. Psalm 51. Now this is after David. I mean, you know, David was a shepherd boy. He really had an intimate relationship with the Lord as a little boy to spend hours singing songs and psalms and practicing his slingshot and getting very good at it in a relationship with God. Now he's a grown man, he's king, he's been out there in the battles, getting a bit bored of it all, stays home, wanders through his palace, looks down and sees bear Sheba, right? But I mean, she kind of knew that she had direct view of, of the king's palace. It says she was out there having a shower, so, you know, I mean... Adultery is not rape. Adultery is two consenting adults, isn't it? But this is after that. King David's kind of fallen. And, you know, this was a terrible period of his life because not only did he have an affair with Bathsheba, she got pregnant. And so then he tries to cover that up. And then it ends up in murder and all sorts of things. And the weight on David's heart is, have mercy on me, God. According to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Paul saying, uh, sorry, um, David saying, yeah, I've done these terrible things that have hurt other people, but what I've really done is damaged my relationship with God. Help me. So here's Jairus' daughter right there. Please put life back into what I've harmed. And I love this next part. This is probably one of my favorite parts. Keith Green wrote a beautiful song about this, Create in Me a Clean Heart. Create in me a clean heart, O Lord, and renew a right spirit unto me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with your free spirit. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. There's Jairus' daughter being healed, raised from the dead right there. This is such an important part of our life here. We, we will not have this relationship with the Lord with our heart. It's not the affection for goodness that gets you there. It's the affection for understanding God. That's why we need the Word. That's why we need to keep coming back to it. And I know it seems like a big laboursome thing I do. Spend time in the Word. Read it. Oh, you don't know what it's like for me, Darren. I do. I've been there. But if you'll give it some more attention you're going to have some gyrus of daughters raised from the dead. You're going to have some resurrections. You're going to have some incredible encounters with the Lord. 
and it will be so unexpected and you'll be so filled with joy. And then what do you do, Chris? What do you do then when you get that bit of joy? What do you do next? You eat. Yes, I love it. <laughs> I think we should do that right now. It's only time for us to go and have something to, to drink and eat. You feed it, don't you? Feed that. Keep coming back to the word a little bit more. You don't need a lot. Just a passage here or there each day. Just feed that. Don't let it die again. Okay? But this scripture is so important because it's this intimacy. You know, the woman with the issue of blood, she's happy with just this. I got it. But Jairus says, I need you, Lord, to come into my inner chamber and put your hand on me, on my daughter. There's something so intimate about that, isn't it? Let's pray. Say with me, dear Lord, come into my inner chamber. Lay your hands on my heart and bring back to life the joy of my salvation. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Okay. So, something to eat. We're going to jump ahead. I, oh, yes. Let me read one, one last passage to you. I did have this put in here. Just to confirm, most assuredly I say unto you, lest you eat my flesh and, uh, of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I will raise him up at the last day. Uh, does this offend you? What then, if you should see the Son of Man ascend from where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. And the words that I speak to you are spirit and are life. The Lord's not talking about physical bread when we come to his table. But let's have a look at one last passage, Apocalypse Revealed. I will give to eat from the tree of life, from the book of Revelation. This symbolizes an assimilation of the goodness of love and charity from the Lord. In the word, to eat means symbolically to assimilate. And the tree of life symbolizes the Lord in respect to the goodness of love. Thus, eating of the tree of life symbolizes an assimilation of the goodness of the love from the Lord. To eat means symbolically to assimilate because as natural food when eaten is assimilated into the life of our body, so spiritual food when received, is assimilated into the life of our soul. The Lord saying give her something to eat is not talking about food. He's saying that daughter affection in you, that young daughter, that joy of salvation, of coming to know the Lord, feed it. Keep it alive. Don't let it die. Don't let it wither. Amen? All right hard for me sometimes because I could give you 10 more exciting things that I want to share, but enough. It's enough. What is important is that we come away with a better understanding and an assignment. Allow the Lord to strip you of any fears and doubts concerning his plan for your life and future. Find a passage of hope such as Jeremiah 29 11, and make this your daily focus for the next week or so. This is what Jeremiah 29 and 11 says and 12 and 13. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Lord, this day as we gather around your word, may we seek you with all our heart those areas that look like they're dying or that are hemorrhaging. Come, heal them. Lay your hands on them. Let them have newness of life. Even now. Even now. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. So we'll close the word, Max, if you want a, a new commandment.
one to another by this will all men know you are my disciples if you have love one for another the lord bless you the lord keep you the lord make his face to shine upon you the lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you everlasting peace amen give them something to eat Give them something to eat, coffee, tea, something to eat. Amen. <laughs> it's good to see everyone again. I hope you had a good Christmas and good New Year and, and it's going to open door in 24, something like that. <laughs>